Hello and welcome to this very special episode of On Liberty Extra. I'm Monica Wilkie, a policy analyst here at the Centre for Independent Studies. And today I'm going to be talking with professor, evolutionary biological scientist, author, YouTuber, and author of the recent best-selling The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense, which has received praise from Dr. Jordan Peterson, who said, read this book, strengthen your resolve, and help us return to reason. Dr. Gad Saad, welcome. How are you? So good to be with you. Thank you very much for being here. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. So, I'd like to start in the subtitle of your book, you say how infectious ideas are killing common sense. How can ideas be infectious? Well, they spread akin to how actual viruses spread. So many years ago, Richard Dawkins has, had introduced the term a meme in, in The Selfish Gene, a, a great book, by the way, which everybody should read, where he talked about how, in the same way that we have genes that propagate, we also have memes, which are packets of information that spread from brain to brain. But a meme could be anything. It could be a, 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 a jingle. It could be an advertisement. It could be you know, any, a song uh, or it could be a religion. That would be a memeplex. But in my book, I'm not talking so much about memes, but rather I, I use the what's called the parasitological model. I argue that bad ideas are akin to brain worms. They're parasitic in that they alter the behavior of the person who is parasitized, causing them to walk quietly into the abyss of infinite lunacy. So what are what are these ideas that you're talking about, the bad ideas specifically that concern you? Sure. So, but first, let me maybe just uh, continue drawing the analogy with the actual brain parasites. So there's a field called neuroparasitology, whereby you study how uh, a wide range of animals could be parasitized by actual brain worms. So, for example, Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite that infects the brain of mice so that when they are infected with this parasite, they no longer are afraid of, my, of cats. They become sexually attracted to the cat's urine which is not a very good attraction for a mouse to hold. And so I take this principle and I argue that akin to how we can have actual brain worms altering an animal's behavior, these idea pathogens, which I'll explain in a second what they are, serve a similar purpose. They alter our circuitry so that we lose our capacity, for example, to engage in critical thinking. So what would be example of an idea pathogen? So postmodernism a movement that you know was spawned on university campuses 40, 50 years ago is the granddaddy of an idea pathogen because it purports that there are no objective truths. We are completely shackled by subjectivity. We are confined to our personal biases. So to talk about objective reality or an objective truth according to postmodernism is silly. Well, you could imagine how that's a dreadful idea because scientists wake up every day under the working presumption that there are truths to be discovered. Now, a scientific truth can change. What we thought was true 300 years ago might be updated 300 years later. That's why in science we talk about provisional truths, but we do wake up thinking that there is a truth out there to be discovered. Do you want me to give you another example of a pathogen? Yes, I think I think that would be good because you, you've just outlined then uh, uh, why you use this parasitic model and I think I think it's good but I think just to sort of take it that little bit further to make sure our audience understands just one sure. more example would be great. Sure so for example social constructivism is another idea pathogen because it argues that human beings are born tabula rasa and everything that they become is due to the vagaries of socialization of their environments. We're all born with equal potentiality and then it's only the nefarious forces of our parents and our peers and our advertisements and our rabbis and priests and our peers. So that, that alters who we become. So everybody can wake up and become the next Lionel Messi or the next Albert Einstein. So it's a beautiful and hopeful message, but it is perfectly rooted in hopeful fal falsehoods. Now, social constructivism has a lot of bad downstream effects. So for example, as an evolutionary psychologist, I study things that have a biological root. Well, social constructivism would argue, no, everything that we are is due to social construction. Even something as basic as sex differences and physical strength are not due to morphological differences between men and women or anatomical differences or hormonal differences. They are due to uh, the nefarious forces of socialization. Your parents taught you to play gently, whereas they taught Bobby to play forcefully. And that starts a cascade of 
subsequent behaviors that causes little Johnny to be uh, you know, stronger when he's lifting weights. And so there are all sorts of downstream effects of these bad ideas that extend well beyond the halls of academia. They become part of political platforms, for example. In your in your explanation just then, when you were talking, when you were describing postmodernism, you said, you know, they say that there's no no such thing as objective truth, and a, a scientist's job is to find it, and that can be provisional, right? As you said, you know, knowledge gets updated all the time. Is it is it sometimes possibly just a a, a fallacy? So you know, if what we thought 300 years ago in science, because the evidence is updated, we now think something else. But if you're sort of of the postmodern persuasion, you might look at that and go oh, well, things change, it's all subjective, so my truth is equally as valid as yours. Well, yeah, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example of the lunacy of postmodernism. And the, the, this personal angle that I'm going to share is not some anomalous example. It perfectly apes exactly what postmodernists believe. And so this, I actually discussed this example in The Parasitic Mind. So in 2002, one of my doctoral students had just uh, defended his uh, doctoral dissertation and so we had decided to go out to celebrate myself, my wife, my doctoral student, and his date for the evening. And so prior to going out that evening, he warned me that his date in question uh, was a graduate student in postmodernism, uh, radical feminism, and cultural anthropology, if you will, a holy trinity of bullshit. And so, uh, and the reason why he was telling me this is because he wanted me to sort of be on my best behavior. You know, we're going out to celebrate. Let's not... Uh, get into you know debates and so on. I said, oh, don't worry, don't worry, I'm going to be on my best behavior, which of course was completely untrue. And so about halfway through the dinner, I turned to the lady in question. I said, oh, I hear you're a, you're a postmodernist. Yes, yes, I'm studying postmodernism. So there are no universal truths, correct? No, there aren't. Well, do you mind, as an evolutionary psychologist, I do think that there are universal truths, certainly when it comes to human nature. So can I propose what I consider to be some universal truths? And then you could tell me how I went wrong. She goes, sure, go for it. Okay, is it not true that within Homo sapiens, within humans, only women bear children? Is that not a universal? So she scoffs at my stupidity and my simplicity and says, absolutely not. I said, it's not true that only women bear children. She goes, no, there is a tribe of some island off Japan, whereby within their folkloric mythological uh, realm, it is the men who bear children. So by you restricting the conversation to the biological realm, that's how you keep us barefoot and pregnant. So then after I recovered from the mini stroke I had at listening to such stupidity, I said, OK, well, how about I offer you an example that's maybe a bit less controversial because it seems like it's too corrosive to argue that only women bear children. How about we use the following example? Is it not true since time immemorial that sailors have relied on the following, that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? And here she used deconstructionism, which is from Jacques Derrida. It's a subshoot of postmodernism. She said, well, what do you mean by East and West? Those are arbitrary labels. And what do you mean by the sun? That which you call the sun, I might call dancing hyena. To which I answered, well, fine, the dancing hyena rises in the East and sets in the West. But that gives you a sense of how there is no common sense making where we can meet. We can't agree that there is a sun. We can't agree left and right. We can't agree that women, everything is subjective. So it becomes a form of intellectual terrorism. But for the... For the postmodernists, particularly the example you just outlined, isn't it sort of, I mean, they could say these things, you know, there's no truth, the sun is dancing hyena, all that sort of thing, but don't they sort of get, you know, mugged by reality in the sense that, you know, no one really lives that way. I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll give a short anecdote to sort of explain my question. When, when I was at university, I had a lecturer who sort of made kind of a similar argument about, you know, how do we know what's true and that sort of thing. And I just, you know, we were in a, on the seventh floor of a multi-story building. And I asked, you know, do you plan on exiting via the stairs or out the window? Because if there were no subjective truths, then surely you can manipulate gravity. So, you know, even though you might say these things, do people actually live like there are no objective truths? Well, that, that's, it's a great question because, because that's, it, what you just asked exactly explains the distribution of these idea pathogens across different disciplines within the university. So it's not, it's not co coincidental that these idea pathogens, and certainly postmodernism as an idea pathogen, hasn't spread as much in engineering school or in the business school, because those particular fields are 
they, they are tied, there are consequences to idiotic ideas that reject reality. You can't build a bridge uh, using postmodernist physics. You can't build a uh, mathematical model of consumer choice using postmodernist econometrics. So, but in other disciplines, in the humanities and in some of the other social sciences, uh, these professors can pontificate all this nonsense fully removed from the consequences of their, you know, imbecilic ideas. So you, you've mentioned universities uh, in your in your responses up till now. So you you view universities as sort of the the epicenter of where this this parasitic yeah. ideas come from. Yes. So I argue that it takes uh, intellectuals to come up with really dumb ideas, uh, and so. You know, literally every single one of the idea pathogens that I discuss in the book, other ones would be identity politics, cultural relativism, biophobia, militant feminism, transgender activism. All of these things would be other forms of idea pathogens. All of these were spawned in university settings, and they all share a few little kernels of, of similarities. So in the same way that cancer, for example, you know, uh, leukemia is different than pancreatic cancer, which is different from uh, melanoma. But what they all share in common is that they all involve the unchecked division of cells. So if I were to say, well, what is common to all these idea pathogens, all of which were spawned in universities? Well, they start off with a kernel of truth and a noble cause. So, for example, the idea that everything is socially constructed sounds noble because it would be nice to argue that we are all born with equal potentiality. But the reality is that's not true. So what ends up happening is in the pursuit of a noble cause, you end up murdering truth. So take, for example, militant feminism. Equity feminism is a, is a great idea. It basically says men and women should be equal under the law. There is no reason why there should be any institutional obstacles for when, men and women to fully flourish. So by that definition, I am an equity feminist. The problem comes with militant feminism, which pushes the argument much further. It says, in the pursuit of eradicating all sexism, we now have to argue that men and women are indistinguishable from each other. Well, of course, we're not indistinguishable from each other. So here, this is an example of how an original idea that starts off with good intentions then metamorphosizes in complete stupidity. Sort of, I think, a, a counter argument you often hear to this is, well, you know, these are these are just crazy ideas that are contained in the halls of academia. Why, why are we spending so much time talking about these things? I mean, like, as, as you said, you know, we're, we're still building bridges using reality and these sorts of things. Why, why does it actually matter? Well, and I actually address this both in, in the book and in all of my engagements like I am here, that it is completely incorrect to think that this is, you know, just some esoteric nonsense that is restricted to the hallways of some you know, department in the humanities because the people who are trained in this nonsense become the prime minister of Canada. So our current prime minister is a walking manifestation of every idea pathogen discussed in the parasitic mind. So ideas have consequences. They don't, I mean, it's, it's kind of like saying, well, don't worry about the coronavirus. It's going to be restricted to wherever it came from. Well, no, there is no corner of the world right now where it hasn't been impacted by the coronavirus. Same thing with these idea pathogens. Sure, they start in one ecosystem, and then you start off by having an infect, in, uh, you know, uh, infestation amongst university students. But then these university students become heads of HR departments and of companies and of the military and politicians. And so, no, the the, the consequences of these bad ideas is truly global. When the when the pandemic started i sort of I, I heard a lot of people saying you know well finally we can move on from identity politics we've actually got real problems we can stop talking about these things and i was i was skeptical about that in the beginning and i think i've sort of over the few months my my resolve has been hard i mean we saw there was a tweet from the un saying you know that you know this shows why we need to defeat the patriarchy and all these sorts of things and i think you know this you know this is why we need more women leaders and just all this sort of stuff and i th i think that that original thought of well, now we have real problems let's get over this nonsense was kind of based on the idea that that it was nonsense that it was somehow just trivial and unimportant surprise there all the bad ideas are still here as you correctly pointed out look in one of the chapters of the book i talk about uh, the homeostasis of victimology. 
because it's going to speak to the point that you just raised. So uh, a homeostatic system is, for example, your thermostat in your room is a homeostatic system because you set the temperature at a particular temperature that you like, and then it checks. If the temperature is too hot, it puts the air conditioning. If the temperature is too cold, it heats it up, right? So a lot of systems in our bodies, both psychological systems and physiological system, are homeostatic. So if my blood sugar goes, goes below a set point, then I will get hungry and this will cause me to go to the fridge and eat. Well, I argue that the West suffers from a form of homeostasis whereby we, we need to have a set victimology point so that we can feel aggrieved and victimized. And if we don't have it, because we truly don't have you know, such terrible societies, then we will manufacture victimology or we will ever so more redefine what constitutes a transgression so that we can maintain that set homeostatic point. And actually an Australian psychologist proposed the concept of concept creep, which is very similar to my idea of homeostate or, or, or relevant to my idea. He didn't offer my explanation, but these two ideas are really joined together because it basically argues that when you no longer can find everywhere you turn examples of victimology, redefine what constitutes, vic you know, uh, bullying becomes uh, not picking someone to play on the soccer team. So it no longer becomes an act of transgression, an act of omission becomes bullying. Uh, a silence is violence, right? The BLM crowd is now saying it's not enough that you that you, you may not be a racist if you don't actively fight against racism. That inaction is a form of racism. So you constantly redefine what cons what 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 is defined as victimology, so that we can keep self-flagellating that we are an evil society. It's grotesque. And by the way, sorry to interrupt. I know you were going to ask something. It is truly offensive to someone with my background, which by the way, I describe in the first chapter of the book, because I am a war refugee. What I saw as a child escaping Lebanon as Lebanese Jews is what true victimology is. So it's an affront to true victims to then see people saying that they need psychiatric treatment because they were misgendered. It's grotesque, it's fragile, and it doesn't build strong people. When we talk about the homeostasis of victimology, how much does the idea of, you know, my truth and my lived experience play into that? So, for example, I could say, look, you know, if you look at the data, you know, women are going to university more, they're getting more degrees, you know, based on, you know, simple metrics, they seem to be doing quite well. But then I could say, oh, well, I didn't get a promotion because I'm a woman, therefore, that's my experience, therefore, society is structurally set up against me. Well, that's the beauty of all these idea pathogens because they work in tandem. It's kind of like when you have a disease and then you have comorbidities. If you have the comorbidities, then then the, you know being infected with the coronavirus becomes worse if you also have diabetes and you're overweight, right? So the beauty of a lot of these pat idea pathogens is that when they work in conjunction with each other, then it becomes a truly dangerous mindset. So it's exactly what you said, right? If there are no manifestations of sexism on campuses, as you so rightly pointed, uh, well, then if a guy rolls his eyes in a departmental meeting when I said something, that was rolling of the eyes rape. You've, you raped me through your roll of the eyes, right? Uh, and again, by the way, at my university now, in order for you to you know, be properly employed, you have to take a mandated uh, seminar that teaches you how to act uh, properly. So imagine again how Orwellian that is. So this was last year I did it. So I'm 56 now. So I was 55. So a 55 year old man who has an exemplary life has to now be taught what constitutes proper behavior. And, and again, it was truly laughable some of the examples. So for example, they might give you a, it was done online. So if you see someone being cat called on campus by a, by a male, is that sexual violence? Now, I knew that the, the answer they wanted to hear was yes, but I wrote no. And then it comes back, it, it, it alerts you and says, mm, you're wrong. Sec, uh, you know, bad words are a form of sexual violence. So imagine again how Orwellian that is, that we no longer have confidence in people to actually treat each other with respect. Your institution has to properly educate you. You, you use the word Orwellian there, which I think is 
probably probably accurate. But I mean, there's there's examples like that on Australian campuses as well, where you have to do you know these sorts of things and in workplaces. And as I, I mean, I, I understand the Orwellian reference, but for mine as well, I always just kind of think like it's almost not immature, right? But like the idea if you've gone through you know decades of your life, even if you're a student, you're you know a young adult that you have no idea how to behave and one online course is going to correct that. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, you're right. It's, it's insane. So, I mean, you're, you're still a lecturer. You teach at a university. You've, you've just outlined that, like, you know, the problems, particularly in the humanities. Do you think these things can be, can be fixed? Do you think, you know, if people want to study, they're still interested in studying the humanities, is it worth it for young people? Yes. So, I, I'm very glad you asked this because oftentimes people think that when I point my criticism to the humanities and to some of the social sciences, I'm denigrating those disciplines. I'm hardly doing that. I think you can study the humanities and many all social sciences in a very serious and rigorous way. You can be a very well-educated person studying uh, aesthetics or f- philosophy of aesthetics or uh, fine art, whatever it is. But you have to be committed to reason, right? It can't be nihilistic. It can't be intellectual terrorism, right? You could study Shakespeare uh, and look at what are some of the universal themes that drive our human nature through an analysis of Shakespeare. So you are still committed to reason and to the scientific method. The problem with a lot of the humanities and the social sciences is that they reject reason, right? It becomes a badge of honor to speak in this faux profundity, this postmodernism. I mean, you know, queering architecture, queering chemistry, I mean, feminist glaciology, this is not stuff that I'm making up, right? These are actual, right? What does it mean, feminist glaciology, right? The study of ice is now under the control of the patriarchy, right? A decolonized mathematics. Well, I mean, I studied mathematics in university. What makes mathematics so beautiful is that it, it, it is a field that exists independent of your identity. So what does it mean to, to decolonize mathematics? The distribution of prime numbers is the distribution of prize numbers, whether I'm a transgender person or I'm a Lebanese Jew. So again, it has almost become a form of, in, in biology, you talk about a runaway form of sec, of selection where the more insane you are, the more it, it manifests that you are a progressive and woke person. It's insane and we have to fight back against this nonsense. You just mentioned runaway selection there. I wonder if you could just go into a little bit more detail of what that is because in your book you use the example of a of a peacock's tail and if you could expand on that i think that would be great sure sure so for example so charles darwin proposed two different mechanisms to to explain the evolution of traits and behaviors some traits evolve because they confer a survival advantage right and other traits evolve because they confer a reproductive advantage so if you take the peacock's tail the peacock's tail which is very large tail, very conspicuous tail, it, it is very uh, physiologically costly to carry it, could not have evolved through natural selection because having that tail actually reduces your survivability. It makes it easier for predators to catch you. It makes it easier for predators to see you with all of the iridescent coloring, right? So how could such a tail have evolved? Well, it evolves through a form of recurring female mate choice, right? The females are basically choosing these mates because these males are saying, look at me, despite the fact that I carry this very burdensome tail that reduces my survivability, I'm still standing here. So this is what we call in biology a Zahavian signal or a costly signal. In other words, for me to be able to differentiate between the fakers and the truly great males, they have to carry a costly signal. So for example, let's put it in the human context. If all it took to convince you that I'm a warrior worthy of your attention is for me to do five sit-ups, well, then every single male could meet that signal because we could all do five sit-ups. But if you ask me, as, in, as they do in Vanuatu, which is a rite of passage in, in the South Pacific, to go on top of a 100-foot uh, platform, tie vine ropes to my ankles, and then dive headfirst, it's the precursor to bungee jumping, by the way, and then dive headfirst so that a few inches before my head splatters on the ground, the vine rope stops me. Boy, that's an honest signal of my bravery and courage. So the peacock's tail arises, evolves to this form of runaway selection. So I argue 
that all of these progressive signaling are, if you like, a form of similar signaling, right? You have to become more and more insane in your positions to demonstrate in an honest way that you are truly progressive. It's grotesque. Does, does this have possible, you know, positives if you look at the other way? You said, you know, if you, the peacock makes itself so big that, you know, predators can't get it. I mean, you know, I, I sort of thought, I think a lot of people thought it was a bit funny when, you know, Spotify tried to cancel Joe Rogan and there was the recent, you know, Jordan Peterson, Penguin Random House thing. And, you know, I just sort of rolled my eyes and thought there's there's no way they're going to get cancelled. They're too big a targets. Do you think that sort of works in the opposite way as well? <laughs> Yeah, so that's the, the too big to fail argument. Uh, yes, I mean, so that's it's not quite the same mechanism as the evolution of the peacock's tail, but uh, you're right. I think that uh, one of the reasons why some of the folks who have very large platforms appear to be uncancelable is precisely because they're quite big. But I would argue there's another uh, factor here that makes some people less likely to be cancelled than others. And that's something that I actually discussed in the last chapter of the parasitic mind. And so I tell people to activate their inner honey badger. So let me explain why I use that, that analogy. Uh, a honey badger is a extraordinarily fierce animal. It is the size of a small dog, and yet you could have six lions approach it and they run away intimidated. Well, how could a small looking dog intimidate six lions? Well, because it's outlandishly fierce. And so I argue that people, if you have a set of principles that are truly well-reasoned, well articulated, and that you have a set of first principles that you can use to defend your positions, you have to be an ideological honey badger. And that's exactly what I am, by the way. So anybody, I don't know if you follow me on social media, but anybody who follows me in any of my engagements, if you come after me, you better really have your ducks in order. Because if not, I'm going to come after you. I'm going to come after your ancestors. I'm going to come after your dead ancestors. I'm, and I don't mean that in an obnoxious, you know, v villainous way. I mean that when I, when I know what I know, then I fight for my positions with all the alacrity that you could imagine. But here's the warning. When I don't know something, then I come at you with complete epistemic humility. So for example, if you were to ask me now, Monica, uh, what is your view on the legalization of marijuana? Well, I would tell you, you know, I simply don't know enough about the subject to pronounce an intelligent position. So when I know, I walk like a honey badger. And when I don't know, I, I bow my head in humility. Uh, talking about uh, knowing what you know, I uh, first came across you, like I think probably others would, when you were interviewed on on Joe Rogan. And the, the reason you piqued my interest was you, you went, th went through, uh, when you're talking about toy preferences between yes. boys and girls and like the, the way you sort of outline that. And you also have this in your book where you call it the nomological methods of cumulative evidence. And I just wondered if you could go through that toy preference example and then explain what what that is and how you come about your evidence, just because I thought yes. it was it was very thorough and I hadn't heard it before. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. So that's actually chapter seven in the book where I talk about how to seek truth. And it's no so I, I and what I argue is that you build nomological networks of cumulative evidence. So let me step back before I explain that using the toy preferences example that you asked about. Let me give you the background to this. So to go back to Charles Darwin, when Charles Darwin was developing his, his the or, or amassing the evidence for his theory of evolution, he, you know, he didn't collect, uh, uh, you know, data from 30 undergrads in psychology at uh, uh, University of New South Wales and then mic drop, he's done. Instead, over a 30 year period, he assiduously collected data from many different disciplines, biodiversity, ecology, animal morphology, uh, eco you know, so paleontology, geology, so that all of these lines of evidence, when put together, made his theory unassailable. So he, if, if you'd like, he was sort of the original synthetic thinker in that, in that vein. And so in, in, in chapter seven, what I argue, I try to formalize this type of thinking. Because when I was in my scientific career, when I was trying to convince all these hostile social scientists that evolutionary psychology was very important to understand human affairs, I had independently developed this train of thought. So let me, let me explain it using the toy preferences. So let's suppose you come at me, Monica, and say, well, toy preferences are socially constructed. Little boys learn to play with trucks and little girls learn to play with dolls. 
And that's why we have those toy preferences. And let's suppose I wanted to prove to you, Monica, that no, there are biological and evolutionary reasons why we see these sex-specific toy preferences. How would I go about building this nomological network of cumulative evidence? So I'll give you a few lines of evidence. Well, I can go to comparative psychology, which is the field that looks at other animals and compares them to human behavior. So I could look at vervet monkeys, rhesus monkeys. I could look at chimpanzees and show you that the infants within those species exhibit the exact same sex-specific toy preferences as human infants. Well, already just that data is sufficiently convincing to end the story right there, but I'm not gonna stop there. I'm gonna drown you in a tsunami of evidence. So then I could get you data from developmental psychology, whereby I could show you that children who are too young to be socialized, in other words, they are in the pre-socialization stage, already exhibit those sex-specific toy preferences. I could get you data from medicine. So there's a disorder called congenital adrenal hyperplasia that when it afflicts little girls, they, it masculinizes their behavior. So little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia have toy preferences that are like those of boys. So that hormonal disorder causes them to have a uh, reversal of their sex-specific toy preferences. So bit by bit, I will get you data from completely different cultures, different disciplines, different time periods, all of which point to the innate sex-specific nature of toy preferences. I didn't get hysterical. I didn't get emotional. I didn't scream. I simply drowned you in an overwhelming amount of evidence. And so I argue that if people want to win arguments, if they truly want to stake veridical positions, then they have to have the cognitive discipline to build such cumulative networks. Thank you for doing that. I, guess I just wanted to bring it up because I found it a very interesting way of how you laid out these sorts of things. So in your in your book, you also talk about how, you know, sort of the dichotomy of ideas that we we tend to we tend to talk about. So I think it'll be good if you just explain what you mean by that. And then also sort of I'll I'll follow up questions so you can go on. Like are are these dichotomies unavoidable? Because you know sometimes I hear people say, oh we've got to move beyond tribalism, blue team, red team, but is is that actually possible? Right. So uh, I, I think what you're referring to there is in chapter two, I, I'm talking about, uh, you know, truth versus hurt feelings. And I start that chapter where I'm trying to talk about the dichotomy of thinking versus feeling. And here I use the term that I coined epistemological dichotomania. It, it, a lot in science is about creating these opposing forces, nature versus nurture, right? Reason versus emotions, thinking versus feeling. And I argue that in many cases, these are false dichotomies. So let me first begin with the nature nurture, and then I'll discuss the th thinking versus feeling. Uh, much of who we are is really an inextricable mix of nature and nurture. So for example, if you take a cake, before you bake the cake, each of the ingredients of the cake are there to see, the eggs, the flour, the sugar, the butter, they're each delineated. Now, once I bake the cake, I can no longer tell you, Monica, could you please point to the eggs? Could you please point to the sugar? It's an inextricable melange at that point. Well, our, who we are is really an inextricable mix of our nature and our nurture. As a matter of fact, nurture doesn't exist outside of nature. Nurture exists in its form because of nature. Okay. So having established that, I then go to the main point of that chapter where I'm trying to talk about thinking versus feeling. And I argue it's wrong to think that we are either a reasoning animal or a feeling animal. We're both. The trick is to know at which point to trigger which of the two systems. So for example, if I'm taking a shortcut to get home uh, through a dark alley and I notice three young men loitering around, my heart might start racing. I might st my heart might stop, my blood pressure might go up. Well, that's an emotional fear response that's perfectly adaptive. It makes sense for me to experience that adaptive fear response. In this case, my emotional system kicked in. It makes perfect sense. If I'm trying to solve a calculus problem in my math class, all of the emotional triggering that you want is not going to help me solve the math problem. Now, let's apply it to, to a more relevant context. When you're trying to stake positions regarding which politicians you should choose in a presidential election, regrettably, most of my highfalutin ivory tower dwelling colleagues have only their emotional system triggered. Trump disgusts me. 
he's repulsive, he's disgusting, right? Each of those positions I just enunciated are strictly based on my affective system, my emotional system. On the other hand, that, uh, Barack Obama, he's so lanky, he's so majestic, he has such a radiant smile. So in both cases, I never argued about positions. One repulses me, affective, and one draws me in, affective. There's an expression in Arabic, I'm gonna use a prop if you don't mind. For, for a second, pretend that this is a cork of a wine bottle. There's an expression that I use from Arabic that basically says, getting drunk by simply smelling the cork of the wine bottle, right? What does that mean? It basically is saying, I don't need to drink the wine to actually get drunk. I simply have to smell the cork. So when I say, my God, Obama is so majestic, he's so presidential, I'm not saying anything about his positions. It's just an affective uh, argument. And therefore I'm getting drunk by the cork of the bottle. So it's not that we are thinking or feeling, it's that we should use the right system in the right context. I mean, I think the the politics example is a good one, right? Because even even with people who are politically interested, sometimes, oh, you know, why do you like this person? It's like, oh, well, that person's creepy, but that person sort of seems nice. But like, isn't isn't it to a, a certain extent that's unavoidable, right? I mean, particularly sort of the politics we've had over the last few decades since you know we have TV and they all have image consultants and you know you've got to decide how to dress and what to do and you know it's it's the way you talk. Even even sometimes when you watch the news after a politician's given a speech, it won't, oh, well, actually, to use the example of the vice presidential debate, I mean, how much talk about there was that a fly landed on Pence's head, and that sort of seemed to be so much of that, and it was, you know, what did that mean, and how do we feel about that? Like, you know, can can we actually get out of that? Well, so, uh, it's a challenge, and because I think most people are cognitive misers, meaning that they are, frankly, cognitively lazy, and so, we deploy fast and frugal heuristics in making decisions. Now, in some cases, those fast and frugal heuristics make sense, right? So for example, there are certain marker, physiological markers that I can detect in someone that can very quickly allow me to establish whether they have social dominance, how they carry themselves, how they walk, right? So for example, it's no mystery that all other things equal, if a politician is taller, then he, he or she, well, typically he in this case, is preferred because all other things equal, tall height is a good, I mean, having height is a good thing, okay? Uh, having facial morphology that uh, exudes testosterone is a good thing. So some fast and frugal markers are good, but others are completely useless, right? So when it comes to something as important as a presidential choice, I'd like to think that people, you do more than simply say he's dreamy. But now let's look at Justin Trudeau. When I was on my personal Facebook page, where I have many colleagues who are my friends on my personal Facebook page, colleagues meaning fellow professors, well, all the middle-aged female professors were commenting about how dreamy he was. Well, for a second, imagine imagine for a second you reversed it. Imagine if it were uh, middle-aged male professors commenting only about how dreamy a female politician was. But apparently, the fact that he had gorgeous hair and that he was tall and he was cute was enough for these female professors to vote for him. It's grotesque. Do you know his policies? Do you know where he stands on foreign policy, on monetary policy, on domestic policy? It didn't matter. He's just a young, dreamy guy. I don't know if we can get out of that because it's part of our evolutionary you know, makeup to fall prey to some of these cues, but I'd like to at least appeal to people when they're making consequential decisions to think before they choose. Well, you know, in uh, Jordan Peterson's praise of your book that I read out in my introduction, he, he said that, that your book can help us return to reason. And I'm interested in your thoughts, like, you know, do you think there was a, a time when this was better? Because I, I sort of instinctively, you know, balk against when people say, oh, everything was better in the past. You know, it's the now that's the problem and sort of nostalgic. But do, do you think that there was actually a time where, you know, these ideas couldn't have gotten up where we were more reasonable, where universities were more rigorous? So I think because of the proliferation of this cocktail of idea pathogens that I cover in the parasitic mind, we are now in a, in a bad spot. So if I, would, if I would have said 40 years ago before postmodernism took over all over the place, we were in a better place. Uh, when we didn't have identity politics ruling our societies, we were in a better place. By the way, Lebanon, 
where I escape from is exactly what happens to a society that is run by identity politics, right? In Lebanon, everything is determined by religious tribalism. So imagine how disconcerting it is for someone like me to see that one of the two parties right now in the United States is really pushing the idea of identity politics. I escaped Lebanon so I can escape from identity politics. And now you have the Democrats pushing it at every turn of the corner. So uh, I think we are slightly in a worse position today than we were, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago along some of these metrics. But I think we could quickly reverse the tide if people speak out. If they don't speak out, then it will be a long train ride to hell. So we've we've been chatting here for about 40 minutes now, Gad, and I just want to say uh, we have a live audience out there. So hello to everyone who has been watching and joining in. And some people have been submitting questions. And there's a, a particularly good one here that I think is is worth addressing. It It goes back to our discussion earlier when we were talking about cumulative evidence. And I just want to know, is is there a danger with gather, gathering evidence for a cumulative network that we fall victim to confirmation bias in that we are only seeking and collecting evidence that supports our existing view? Uh, look, th that is that is always a possible danger in, in anything, not only in building these cumulative networks of you know normological networks, uh, but if you are truly an honest pursuer of the truth, then you won't do that, right? So uh, when I build these nomological networks, it might be the case that for one of the lines of evidence, it actually goes contrary to my position. Well, then I will still report it. But the beauty of building these nomological networks is that the totality of the evidence will still support my position. So even though one or two lines of evidence might be somewhat tenuous, and that's why you have to be sufficiently disciplined to build these networks so that the totality, the tsunami of evidence favors me, right? So it's kind of like when you are a, when you are in a courtroom and you'd say, you know, did you make your case beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So maybe some of the evidence doesn't support your position, but the totality of evidence argues that your position is vertical. So if you are honest, you shouldn't succumb to that bias. So it, it's it's almost kind of like, you know, when you have one or two outliers, it doesn't completely mean you throw everything out because you still have the, the weight of the evidence is on your side. Well, and, and or, or there's, you, or there's, there's the point you're trying to make, not your side necessarily. Exactly, exactly. So uh, on a more, uh, you know, uh, uh, microscopic level, take, for example, something that often happens in evolution psychology. So I might say, uh, well, uh, within you, the human species, there is a sexual dimorphism. There is an evolved sex differences such that men are taller than women. Well, that, that's simply a scientific fact, okay? So someone will raise their hand, uh, but but Dr. Saad, my aunt Lori is taller than my uncle Joe. Oh, God damn, Darwin is dead. Let's go back to the drawing board. The fact that your, un your aunt Linda is taller than your uncle Joe, so that's a singular datum, doesn't falsify a statement that is true at the population level, correct? So the fact that, humans are a sexually reproducing species is not falsified by the fact that homosexuality exists or that they are celibate monks, right? So when you're building the nomological network, the fact that a single datum might go contrary to the totality of your position is okay. The totality, though, is still that I'm winning that argument. I think um, from, from what you've said, you mean, you know, we, we've kind of painted a a picture of things being a little bit dark at the moment, but I, I also kind of sense that you are you are optimistic. I mean, you, you've described how we can get about out of this. You talk about you know the honey badger and how we can return to reason, all these sorts of things. And I I often like to finish these things on a slightly optimistic note. And I think it would be good because what what I liked, I mean, it's not at the end of your book, but you have you have this chapter where you talk about what are the non negotiables for you in a in a free and modern society and i think we could just finish by having you just outline those because i just think it's it was fantastic the way how you just said it so clearly it wasn't that you know all oh, these are nice things to have or that you know well we can have this but we can give it's like you know no these are the things that we need if we want right. to be a free society so you need to have freedom in all of its instantiations freedom of thought freedom of inquiry freedom of speech without that there's no point about talking about anything else and then once we agree that we have those freedoms, we have to have an epistemology that allows us to adjudicate what is true and what is not. The beauty of the scientific method is it, it's, it is exactly that, right? It frees us from the shackles of our personal identities. So this is why, for example, I argue that the die religion, I call it the die religion, diversity, inclusion, and equity, is an affront. It's a cancer to human dignity because it basically says 
well, we need to hire a transgender person of color in our physics. No, no, no. Science doesn't care about your identity. So as long as we have societies that are fully free in every possible way, and as long as we have the epistemology to adjudicate what is true and not, then the rest we can work on. But if these two bedrocks are attacked, then we're back to the dark ages. So to end on an optimistic note, I think that, so based on the number of emails that I receive on a daily basis, I can assure you that the silent majority detests this stuff. So you, you don't need 100,000 blue haired people on campus to keep everybody else cowering in the corner, afraid to utter a word. You just need a few vocal activists and then everybody stays quiet. So the reality is the silent majority is currently cowardly. If they find their spine and speak out in unison, then we can very, very quickly eradicate these idea pathogens and return to reason. If we don't, if we constantly subcontract our voice, you know, God sad will take care of it. Well, you know, Jordan Peterson is on this. I'm too afraid to do it. I'm too busy preparing for my daughter's wedding. Then it will be, as I said, a long and slow death. So please rise up. Please get involved. Your voice matters. You don't have to be a fancy professor. You don't have to have a big platform. Just get engaged in fighting against these parasitic ideas. Dr. Gad Saad, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a fantastic discussion. Oh, thank you so much. Cheers. So, uh, Dr. Saad's book, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Diseases Are Killing Common Sense, are out, is out now. You can also find him on YouTube at The Sad Truth and all matter of social media platforms. Thank you so much for joining us today from uh, people all around the world. It's been fantastic to have your digital company. I'm Monica Wilkie for the Centre for Independent Studies. Please make sure you like and comment on this video and subscribe to our channel for more fantastic content like this. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.